Uh, right, I, this, I'm just going to sort of talk about some sort of theories and ideas I've had um, for my dissertation that I'll be doing next year, and just sort of inspiration and ideas I've had. Um, so I'll start in sort of, uh, 1982, uh, when the anthropologist Paul Ravenel was interviewing Michael Foucault, and he asked him um, why there are so many spatial metaphors in his sort of in his writing, his philosophy. And Michael Foucault, Foucault started talking about how um, scientific knowledge, modern Western knowledge, is a sort of spatialization of knowledge, whereas sort of indigenous people would have said. Um, eating that red leaf would kill you, it's a, which is a sort of very temporal, it's, it's about experience, um, it's, it's process, it's narrative. Western knowledge would have put it into a spatial realm. It would have been, um, they would have described the number of atoms within that leaf. Um, they would have described uh, the dimensions, and it would have also been literally spatialized in sort of illustrative prints. And I thought this was uh, quite an interesting concept, that there's a sort of difference between uh, native knowledge, for lack of a better word, and our sort of orthodox Western knowledge. And anthropologists, I think, um, sort of do some of utilize this spatialization of knowledge. Um, they take stories and myths that already exist and put them into their own sort of structural theories or sort of into kinship diagrams or it's sort of, it's sort of an aggressive sort of act of taking sort of indigenous knowledge out. And what's great about sort of symposiums like this is how anthropologists are bringing knowledge back into a sort of temporal realm. We're telling stories, we're sort of stringing narratives together. We're you know creating our own sort of mythology. Um, another sort of entity you use the spatialization of knowledge to sort of uh, possibly less good ends are states, and I think of statecraft as sort of taking. Uh, of the, as a spatialization of knowledge, they're taking social facts on kinship religion exchange and making them visible to the state because the state is blind. You know, it's only you know a few thousand people. It's an institution. They can't know <coughs> all social things that happen. They need they need to make it visible. And so you take sort of um, family names and put them onto genealogical trees. You take households and then map them through a grid system of roads and plan in plan cities and personal exchanges are sort of figured into a network of taxation. And even in modern states, CCTV is sort of uh, literally spatialized. You know, your everyday actions are put into sort of a spatial form. And um, so I think the modern environment is actually a living map. Uh, the way I'm, I think it is um, the London Underground is obviously messy, it's like spaghetti. Um, the map simplifies it, but statecraft is actually using the map not only as a way of understanding uh, the landscape, but actually the <laughs> map for how to continue the landscape. You know, um, streets are made to be more legible. Um, cities are designed to um, sort of uh, conform to sort of easier ways of design. It's not as organic. It's not grown out. Um, the example that James E. Scott uses is Bruges, um, where he said it's sort of like a language. Where it's, if you were just to go there you wouldn't understand the logic of it. You wouldn't understand why the meat market is there or why the church is there. But the people there, they know it like a sort of um, a local language. And they, it has a sort of social logic. You know, it's got, it's, it's completely social. And it's grown up organically out of the social. Uh, modern statecraft, that, this is Chicago, <coughs> is designed something uh, far more legible. But it's, it's, it's conforming to the map of, um, the original territory. If you can't kind of see the point I'm trying to make that it's not just a map, it's a sort of living map. It's an actual sort of social map that exists. Um, now, I think our relationship with this living map is obviously a sort of complex and interesting, our relationship with space and place. And so a group I think would be worthy of ethnographic study are uh, urban explorers, or some of them are called place hackers, which is a fantastic idea that you can sort of hack a place in the same way you can hack a computer or um, like um, hack a piece of equipment to do something different. They, they're actually hacking these places and spaces, quite sort of abstract of it. And so they obviously explore these sort of hidden urban environments, places you don't normally see. Uh, this is a mental asylum near where I live in Croydon, and it's common among sort of urban explorers. Um, there are also the Catafield, who explore the uh, catacombs underneath Paris. And there's a sort of intellectual movement and alternative movement that's grown up around this. And 
in the sort of what Guy Debord called the society of the spectacle, where we live in sort of uh, everything is about the spectacle of late capitalism, they are sort of breaking through the spectacle. They are um, sort of creating a historical consciousness that's hard to achieve. They are exploring little rooms and corridors with different psychic intent, um, intensities and finding little sort of objects of sort of historical value or cultural value, and they're stringing it together into a narrative. They're sort of re-temporalizing knowledge or they're despatializing knowledge, if you say. And I think it'd be it's sort of fascinating to study how they sort of relate to the environment and how they create a sort of historical identity. Um, over time, these sort of buildings and places have been packed with historical artifacts, both intentionally through their design and just through the process of time. Um, and urban explorers are sort of unpacking this landscape. Uh, another group I thought would be great to study uh, for ethnographic interest are ghost hunters, who um, obviously they think they're hunting for ghosts, but what they're actually doing is exploring an urban or uh, exploring landscape and place. They are exploring old haunted houses or whatever. And I thought it interesting to think of them as sort of shamans, where a shaman would explore the sort of shamanic landscape with, I don't know, a rattle and feathers or whatever, with their shamanic tools. They use all these weird sort of technological pieces of equipment. These are sort of like their ontological tools with which they explore um, a shamanic landscape that's intertwined with um, the physical place and space. And they are sort of techno shamans who sort of, yeah. And I think they'd be very interesting follow around. You know, if the ghost hunters are interesting, it's, you know, the ghost hunters who are interesting. Um, I think it could be interesting to look at sort of the exact opposite of the <coughs> environment. So these, in, uh, these environments are obviously very packed with sort of um, a cultural presence. You know, things occupy the landscape. So um, maybe look at sort of the modern city like Singapore. Um, it was the first city to, post-colonial city, to reject the British sort of radial method of uh, city design. And it's very, this sort of modern architecture is very sterile and empty. It doesn't have these sort of, it's all about spectacle. It doesn't have this sort of um, knowledge within it that you can unpack. Um, so I, my theory is that the reason why science fiction sort of has affinity with these spaces is not because it's very modern, but because it's very easy to project your own fantasy onto what's an empty landscape. It's just a shell, it's a framework. And um, the, uh, uh, in other spaces, there is already a story, already a narrative that you can take from the landscape. Um, science fiction um, obviously has an affinity with this kind of uh, place. I think this is also similar with sort of the, um, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, I think they realized people were too sort of obsessed um, with the artifacts within your know, Catholic churches are very, um, you know, colourful, filled with things. They're very bright. People were um, too distracted creating narratives from the church. People, their relationship with, with was with the church, not with God. So I think um, sort of Protestant churches represent this sort of blank framework with which people can project their own sort of relationship with God or fantasy or whatever onto the environment. So the Protestant Reformation, the Reformation was as much sort of um, aesthetic and architectural as it was sort of spiritual. Um, so obviously these building cities, state spaces, have great sort of cultural significance and power. Um, they help to replicate society. And for example, social housing is designed for sort of the ideal family. Um, it, it replicates sort of gender norms, sexuality norms. Um, it's designed for a certain amount of children. It's designed, to, like the kitchen work services, designed for a woman to look over um, her children that are in the garden. It's, you know, buildings replicate um, uh, society and they construct society. And uh, equally, these sort of spaces can be subverted by sort of occupations and squatting, which would also be another sort of interesting thing to study. Um, but obviously, the architect and the city planner. Um, is in a very powerful position. Um, they can actually control the replication of society, what the site of society is going to be like. They're not only building buildings, they are building society. Um, I think there's a problem when architecture gets treated as just an art, um, not as a materialization of social relations. It's sort of given too high a status when <coughs> really um, it's actually just a form of subsistence, but it's considered this very sort of holy kind of art. Uh, you know, the art of architecture. Um, 
if you look at uh, vernacular buildings, they're far more organic. They've come out of uh, sort of social relations. They've come out. They've actually. It's a form of subsistence, like I said. Um, this is in Africa, uh, Marrakesh, uh, Italy. Um, it has that sort of um, sprawl that Singapore does, but it's also much more organic. And what I think has happened is a sort of alienation, similar to um, sort of Marx spoke, spoke about money as um, it's hiding what are relations between people and making people think they're relations between people and commodities. I think the same thing has happened with architecture. Architecture is actually a materialization of what are relations between people. Um, but we think of them as relationships between us and the building. Uh, lots of architectural theory is sort of psychological, phenomenological, or looking at aesthetics. And this is sort of hidden, um, the, the sort of social realm that um, architecture is about. So I've, I'm sort of proposing a sort of more sort of social way of looking at architecture, sort of theorizing architecture ethnographically. Uh, there were sort of groups in the 60s, like Barty Graham, of course they're from the 60s, <laughs> um, and they, uh, they, they sort of looking at more sort of the social aspect of architecture. They're all about modularity, um, they designed about choice of the person within the building, choosing how the building is going to actually construct, and they came up, came up some wild ideas, you know, check them out, they're really cool. That's sort of the only reason I put them in. You should really just check them out, they're great. Um, but I thought maybe um, you could actually theorise architecture ethnographically. You know, architects actually need to look at the social sphere when they build the buildings. Or better yet, not actually sort of change what an architect is. I thought maybe we could have um, an ethnotect. So that's sort of a sort of clumsy thrown together of ethnography and architecture. Um, so obviously architecture theorised ethnographically. But it's also eth um, it's getting rid of the sort of the autocratic um, implications of architecture. It means chief builder. Not to, we should get rid of just one person designing a building and have buildings designed socially, more like the sort of vernacular architecture, the indigenous architecture. And so, but also ethnotecture implies um, that the, uh, the person designing the building is also designing culture. It's sort of culture builder or folk builder. They are actually. Um, they have far more power than they realise in, des in the design of buildings. So that's my sort of idea, ethnotecture. Um, are we actually share our um, anthropology department with uh, the architecture department? So maybe this is, one minute, cool. Uh, maybe this is sort of the other elephant in the room. We should actually do more stuff with the architectural department. It would be really interesting. Maybe we could sort of plan stuff for that in the future. Um, I was going to do a bit more, but not much time. So I'll leave it there. And thank you.